Hi everybody, Stu, AG6AG. Today... Hey Stu. Wait, who's that? Hey Stu, how do you make a beginner's ham radio antenna? Whoa, well, hey, looks like we got our first video question. Wow, how do you make a beginner's ham radio antenna? That leaves a lot of openings. Um, well, you know what? Let's all start in the beginning and let's move from there. Oh, shoot, I almost forgot. Hey, do me a favor, click my subscribe button. That helps me get in front of a larger audience to teach more people about amateur radio and technology in general. And you know, if you like my video, click on the like button. And of course, any questions or comments about any video I make, make them in the comment of the video down below. With that, hey, let's check out how to make your first basic ham radio antenna. All right, well, the one thing that's the easiest thing for us to play with as amateur radio operators is antennas. We can make our own antennas, design our own antennas, test our own antennas, and experiment to try to get the most out of where our antenna is located and what materials we have available to build those antennas. Now, I'm going to be bluntly honest. Um, there's certain things that we have to understand before we get started building this antenna, and that's what we're going to start with here. All right, is we're going to start with the actual theory of uh, antennas and resonance. And I know you guys probably learned this in your technician class, okay? But I'm going to give a quick review and try to kind of um, make it a little simpler to understand so it's easier for you to carry forward. All right, so every time I look at uh, a diagram of an antenna. It always has these radiating lines going out or circles or whatever. It's spanning out into the world. Well, that's a great example, but let's talk a little bit about what's really going on. Now, I'm going to show you what a transmitted uh, carrier looks like on an oscilloscope. Okay, when you key that microphone, it puts a carrier on there if you're on FM or AM. Now, sideband's a different subject. We wash out the carrier. But let's, for the example of this, understand that this is a way that we can actually look at what's coming out of the radio on AM or FM. The only difference, amplitude modulation, right? If I'm putting my voice on it, it's going to alter like this, okay? Or uh, frequency modulation, which is going to be bunching and opening up in different sections, right, when I talk or put noise on it, all right? That's kind of the way this works. Now, one of the important things here, as we look at this, we have to remember that we have a lot of individual single cycles in here. What, what a single cycle is, is the uh, uh, repeating cycle that that alternating current is putting out, okay? Basically, uh, you know, we can start our measurement anywhere. I'm starting here at zero, and we'll go from zero here up to high voltage, then down to zero, and then down to negative voltage, and then back up to zero, okay? Uh, and that's basically it, and each one of those is considered a single cycle. Now, if we look at our oscilloscope pattern again, what do we have? Well, if I'm looking at a one second sample, okay, then if I count the number of cycles, that's going to give me my frequency, okay? So how frequent does that cycle repeat? How many times does it repeat in a one second time period? Right. So in this particular case, this illustration, based on that being one second in time, this is a 20 hertz frequency signal. OK, follow that so far. Right. We've got the individual wave. Right. We have the individual cycle 
and we're counting how many occur in one second. Okay? All right. Now, next question. What is the distance that this covers in one second? So, when we look at the speed, the distance any frequency transmission covers is 300 million meters per second, or the speed of light, right? Not just a good idea, it's the law. This is a thing that we can't really alter. The speed of light is an absolute, okay? You can't make it faster or take longer, although you can impede it, okay? Uh, electromagnetic current you can also impede, and we'll talk about that a little bit coming up. So here, if I'm looking at a second of this frequency, right, at 20 hertz, it's 300 million meters per second. Well, what if it was, I don't know, 30 megahertz or 30 million hertz? That would mean 30 million cycles. Well, that 30 million cycles would still travel and be enclosed in a 300 million meter per second window. Okay? Again, get a grip on that. Now, we have this thing we call wavelength, right? And how do we calculate wavelength? Well, we know that this 20 megahertz signal is traveling at 300 million meters per second, okay? And we can calculate how far that individual cycle travels in distance, right? simply by taking that 300 million meters per second and dividing it by the frequency, which would be 20, and that means that that one single cycle or that one wave is traveling 15 million meters. Got that? That single wave is traveling 15 million meters meters. This would be a 15 million meter wavelength. Yeah, I know. We're not dealing with 15 million meters, okay, uh, wavelengths, because that's even sub-audible. Uh, so you can't even hear that as a human. I don't know what animal can hear it. Uh, but anyway, if you can hear 20 hertz, boy, uh, make a comment down below. Anyway, so here's what we've got. All right, let's try to consolidate this all together. My frequency is the cycle count per second, the number of cycles that are in that waveform, okay, over a one-second time sample. Fairly simple. My wavelength is the distance that one cycle travels. When we look at resonance, here's a new word for you, resonance, that is the, uh, the meaning of it basically is that the antenna is ideally resonant or able to receive and send on a particular frequency. We calculate the length of the antenna by taking half the wavelength of the frequency of interest. Frequency of interest is whatever frequency you're trying to make the antenna for. You see, the size of the antenna makes a huge difference, and people people don't get that when they first get in the hobby, so this is important. I also, I have a little symbol up there. It's called the lambda symbol, okay? And in whenever you're talking about wavelengths and things like that, that is the mathematical symbol that is used to symbolize what a wavelength is, okay, or what the wavelength is. So you're going to see a lot of that in uh, formulas and things like that. You're also going to see it in this presentation. So uh, just hold on for that one, okay? Now we're going to introduce something new here. We're going to introduce velocity factor, which is the speed of electricity through a medium. And really all it is is it's a differential, how fast it actually goes through that medium as a percentage of the speed of light in a vacuum. All right. Sounds really complicated. 
but when we talk about velocity factor, we're really talking, um, you know, about the speed of electronic waves in a vacuum. If through metal, if you look down there, we see that in a vacuum, velocity factor would be one. Uh, so I would multiply whatever that distance is by one uh, through a wire be about 95%, so I'd multiply whatever that distance is by 0.95 in order to figure out how long the wavelength actually is going through the wire. Uh, coax, interestingly enough, the coax that we all seem to use, um, it actually has a velocity factor of uh, 66% or 0.66, and we would do the same calculation to see how fast the waves move through coax. And that's mostly because it's unbalanced. And I, you know, there's a lot of subject in that that we really don't want to cover today. But if you ask, maybe I'll give a little bit more elaborate uh, explanation of all that. Anyway, so if I'm looking at through metal at the speed of electromagnetic waves, I'm looking at about 285 million meters per second. So Let's see if I can pull all this stuff together to show you how to make an antenna. All right, so let's start with, we're going to work with the frequency of interest of 29 megahertz, okay? That's 29 million hertz. That is right in the center of the phone band for amateur radio for the 10 meter um, uh, band, okay? And we can calculate that out actually by taking 300 and dividing it by that frequency or 300 million and then dividing it by 29 million. Okay, I can get rid of all those extra zeros and just make 300 divided by 29 and that's going to give me 10 meters. Okay, that tells me that that's the 10 meter band. That's what all that is about when you're looking at the different bands and their identifiers, right? Two meters, why don't we just call it 146? Why don't we, you know, what is the two meters? That's what it is. Okay, it is the wavelength of the frequencies. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well, if I take half the wavelength, that's about five meters, okay? So that means it's about 16-ish feet, uh, and we'll go deeper into that calculation, but we can kind of figure out if we're going to put an antenna up for 10 meters, we know that we're going to need 16 feet, okay? And remember, most of the um, HF band uses horizontally polarized antennas where most of the time, not always, VHF, UHF, and the higher frequencies, uh, shorter wavelengths, use vertical antennas, right? Um, and the reason being is basically who you're trying to talk to and what the pattern is. There's lots of different antennas out there. We'll kind of get into that in a minute. But, um, so... In, math ma in mathematics, let's take a look at all the conversions here, all right? If I'm really going to make an antenna, I'm probably going to want to convert 300 million meters into feet, okay? And there are 3.28 feet per meter. We just do the math. It gives us 984 million feet per second. Uh, now, I need to figure out what half of that is, right? Because we want half a wavelength for our calculation for an antenna. So I'll divide that by two, and that's going to give me 492 million feet. And then I need to calculate out the velocity factor in this. So I am going to be using copper wire, and that, again, has an approximate velocity factor of about 95%, eh, eh, a little over. Uh, and I'm going to do the math. I'm basically going to multiply that 482 million feet by 95 or 0.95. And that's going to give me 468 million feet. And that's rounded up. The reason I'm rounding up is you always want to cut long so you can fold it back and bring it down into resonance. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit when we get to SWR. So, Let's just do it this way. I've got a frequency of interest. I want to tune for the middle, so I want to be the most resonant right there, 
right, at 29 uh, megahertz because that's the middle of the phone band. And I want to I wanna work phone on this. I'm not going to work CW or any of that. So I want to work phone. So if I calculate that, I'm going to take 468. I'm going to divide it right there by 29 or my frequency of interest, right? Because all I'm doing is stripping off those six zeros from both numbers. That's going to give me 16.14 feet. So, what that means is that when I start talking about my dipole antenna, I am going to have a quarter wave on both sides, right? So, all right, the center right here in the middle, let me see if I can pull a pointer up here. One second. There we go. So, this little booger right here, that is the center of... Um, the coax, okay? You see that coming down? That is actually, all that there is the connector to the coax. When we look at both sides here, right, this side and this side, that's horizontally polarized. That is what we consider the element of the antenna, okay? I need to make that clear because my drawing probably isn't real good with that. So what you're seeing, that circle indicates that that's a coax connection. Okay, so there's a simple dipole. Now, here is a representation of our half wavelength, right? There it is, right? I've got wavelength divided by two or wavelength over two, and that is half of it. I'm starting at the highest point of voltage here and the lowest point of voltage there, all right? Let's overlay that onto our new dipole. And, and what you can see here is I've got a quarter wave on one side and I've got a quarter wave on the other. All right, so what does that really mean? So I need to make sure that when I make this dipole, it is properly trimmed for my frequency of interest. That's what makes an antenna work, okay? So these measure means measurements are extremely important. And guess what? I can even take this dipole and turn it vertical, right? Because now this dipole is vertically polarized and I can use it uh, on higher bands. Let's say I want to make a dipole for, oh, uh, two meters. I could do that, right? Just using the same model. And again, right, I'm going to need that wavelengths to be properly cut. So quarter wavelength on each side, right? And that's the important thing to remember is you have one quarter wavelength that is connected to the shield and one quarter wavelength that is connected to the center conductor of your coax. That's how an antenna works, okay? All right, so we turned it vertical. Now, how are we going to mount this? You know, it's got a big thing hanging on the bottom, and if I put it on a metal mask, it's going to interfere and everything else. Well, that's where the quarter wave ground plane antenna design comes in. And basically, you have a quarter wave for the vertical side, and then at the base, I've got a ring here to represent it, but you can have what are called radials, which are just conductors coming out of the bottom. You want probably a minimum of three. Um, it can even be a, a big flat dish if that's what you want. Uh, but it has to be a quarter wave radius, okay? Or, of course, those single radios need to be a quarter wave long in order for the antenna to be resonant and do the best at receiving and transmitting. Look how about here. Um, a receiving antenna doesn't need to be as critically measured. But when you're transmitting, you can create additional problems for the radio if it's not properly adjusted for the frequency of interest you're going to be transmitting on. Okay? We can also take the example of a mobile radio, right? with a mobile antenna that is a quarter wave in height and sits upon a metal plate. Uh, and this is what mag mounts are all about, right? You pop the mag mount on there. Same rule applies, though. 
you need that metal surface. You need that quarter wave radius around the center of where that antenna is for the antenna to work properly. Because remember, the total size of the antenna that we need is a half wave. A quarter wave for the center conductor and a quarter wave for the um, uh, coaxial portion of it, right? Uh, the shield. And, uh, you know, it, that's an important thing. I mean, we can go into ladder line and all sorts of other stuff, but what it really comes down to is there are two sides, two wires that go to an antenna. One goes to the top quarter wave, one goes to the bottom quarter wave, or one goes to the uh, uh, right quarter wave, one goes to the left quarter wave. And it's just that sort of thing, okay? Now, here is an example. This little piece of PVC, that is a two-meter dipole. It could be mounted horizontally, vertically. doesn't really matter. I'd have to mount it on a uh, uh, fiberglass uh, or uh, PVC uh, mast, but, you know, it's lightweight. It works pretty well. And the design was very simple, right? It's a quarter wave on one side and a quarter wave on the other from that center uh, tap to pick up the coax connection, right? If you look down in, well, here, let me zoom it in a little bit. If you look down in the end here, you'll see a wire. That's just a 14-gauge standard wire. Uh, and uh, oh, you also see a black dog hair in there. Yeah, I've got uh, black labs. So uh, ah, we'll clean that out later. <laughs> anyway, that was a very simple antenna to make. All I did was I made the connections to that, uh, uh, that centerpiece right here. And I laid the wire out, tuned it with it kind of taped to that uh, plastic tube right there. Uh, got it all tuned and adjusted and cut to length and then slipped it into the tube. Sealed it up and double checked my adjustments. Adjustments, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, before we go to adjustments, let's talk about the mag mount. Here's a mag mount. You know, this is, uh, I, I think I bought it on Amazon. I'll put a link to it down in the uh, uh, comments. It, it is just basically a mag mount antenna. Um, this is a quarter wave mag mount for 2 meters and 440. And you'll notice the spiral in there, and that spiral can be used for a couple different things. Um, one thing, of course, it can be used for is uh, vibration. So you know, if you taking stuff off-road and stuff like that, that allows the antenna to flex a little better so it typically won't break at the bottom or whatever, but it may break at that little corkscrew as well. Another thing that's important to remember is this creates inductance. Now, this actually can be used, and it's strategically placed on this antenna because this is a dual-band antenna, and this allows us to get the 440 or 70 centimeter signal tuned to where we want to with the same piece of metal. Um, guess what? Traps and induction and loading antennas and all that kind of stuff. Whole different subject. Anytime you put a bend in an antenna, you're narrowing the frequency of interest that you'll be able to transmit, the, the frequency range. Okay, so just remember that. And of course, all a spooled up wire is, is a straightened wire at one time that was spooled up. By spooling it up, you don't affect the electrical length of the wire. Therefore, you can actually make an antenna a little shorter by spiraling the wire up, at least from a physical standpoint of the area it takes. Is that a good idea? Mm. Again, you reduce the spread of frequencies that you are resonant at, which can create problems. Now, I... I'd have some of my followers probably be a little dismissed if I didn't talk about the 2-meter J-pole antenna, which is also a fairly easy antenna to make uh, for a vertical 2-meter band. And the J-pole is made from copper pipe, 
half inch, three quarter inch, whatever, you go down to the hardware store and buy it and you get all the uh, couplers and all that. And there's great instructions up on the web on how to make these. Um, and it's interesting because they actually use the way that the coax hooks up on, uh, on that, on that little section there, right? That little J portion. And it actually hooks up in a way that changes where the center of your um, uh, resonance signal is being picked up on the antenna. See, this doesn't need any radials, right? And radials themselves are an interesting subject, too, that you could cover for days, you know. Uh, there are lots of different types of antennas out there. Uh, this is a, this is a commercial two meter antenna, very low gain, but you know what? It works great. It's a it's a well made antenna. I own a couple of them, uh, and hey, this is not gonna set you back that much money if you go and buy this. And sometimes for the vertical antennas, that's the easiest choice. If you're talking HF, yes, by all means, let's go out. Let's make some dipoles. Let's get them in the air. Let's learn how to tune them. Let's learn how to do all those things. Um, you know, HF is a little bit different from the standpoint we talk about radials. We have vertical antennas with HF, and they're quarter wave, right? But they have radials of counterpoises coming out down out of the bottom, laying on the ground and stuff like that. And typically with a VHF UHF antenna, we want as much height as we can get off the ground for that antenna to get the farthest distance. Not the case with HF. HF antennas typically might be a couple feet off the ground, okay? And the radials lay right out on the ground, all right? And that's the verticals. Why is that? Well, because you don't want giant long verticals hanging all over the place. And the actual height of the antenna in the case of a vertical is not that important unless you're surrounded by mountains and stuff like that. Again, whole different subject, but just wanted to mention that. Um, the height of a dipole is very important also. Your dipole should be a half wavelength from the ground. You heard me right, a half wavelength. So that 16, or excuse me, that 10 meter antenna that we're building should be off the ground. How far? About 16 and a half, maybe 17 feet. Okay. Uh, now, if I get to 20 uh, meters, okay, that actually doubles how high it has to be. It's got to come up to someplace around 32 to 34 feet off the ground. And of course, it's going to be taking that 32 to 34 feet uh, in, uh, in distance, right, uh, for the horizontally polarized antenna. All right. So I know we've covered a lot of stuff and we're almost done. I only have a couple other things that I want to talk about. And one of them is SWR. And we utilize SWR as a tuning tool. Okay, but we also don't want SWR to be higher than about 1.4, 1.6 to 1, right? Um, and why is that? Well, if you take a look at the chart I have over here, uh, you notice that this is the amount of reflected power that comes back that we measure in standing wave ratio or SWR. 1 to 1. I don't have any power being pushed back into my transmitter. Two to one, I'm at about 33% of the power. So if I'm putting 100 watts into that antenna, I'm getting 33 watts back in, and that's pretty high. And uh, the radio is going to be upset about that. Okay, Two to one is definitely too high. Take a look at three to one, and oh my God, half of everything I put out is getting reabsorbed into my radio chances are I'm going to damage my radio because of that, okay? So you need to get out and adjust that antenna. Now, I, I, I've got a, a MFJ uh, watt meter here. It's called a uh, dual needle, needle watt meter, and basically it reads the watts, and it also looks at the return power, right? And then where those two little... Uh, uh, 
things cross, okay, that is your SWR reading, and you can see that down in the middle of the uh, of the meter. Now to do this, I've got to key my radio up onto an antenna that's out of tune, and then unkey it, adjust the antenna, la 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 la. So I'm going to make a recommendation for a piece of equipment. This is a Nano VNA. Now, this thing does a gazillion things, okay? Uh, it is a very sensitive and excellent piece of test equipment. Uh, however, it's inexpensive in relative terms. This is a sub $100 meter. And you know what? It is excellent at getting you the SWR. I have other videos on how to set this up. Hey, I will admit, they're complicated, but you know what? They work great. And buy one and use it as an SWR tester to adjust your antennas. Get the antenna up in the air, coax coming down, hook this to it, take a look, get the graph going for the band of interest that you're in, and watch where that SWR is, right? And you want that SWR to be as low as possible for the entire uh, band of interest, okay? That group of frequencies that you're going to be using. You have to adjust the antenna when you build it. That's part of the game. Once you get it adjusted, most likely, if it's not moving around, it's going to stay in adjustment and you're not going to have to worry about it. Now, with all that said, I hope that I answered the majority of the question that the viewer sent me. Um, look, you've got dipoles. You've got quarter wave verticals. You've got long wires, both resonant and non-resonant long wires. You've got um, oh, um, off-center fed dipoles. Okay, You have magnetic loop antennas. You have um, dipole or fan dipoles that are multiple dipoles on the same basic coax. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different antenna designs. And you're going to look at all these and you're going to go, which one should I make? Which one is the best one for me? I'm going to let you in on a secret. Okay, It all depends on Several factors, but the important one is how much room do I have where I'm setting the antenna up, okay? How many bands do I want to try to do on this single antenna? How, how many different things do I want to do with it? Um, what am I compromising with certain antenna designs, right? We talked about loading and shortening antennas, but making them electrically as long as the longer antennas. Those are compromise antennas. You lose a lot with those, okay? But it doesn't really matter. When I say a lot, you know, you can lose 50% of your transmit power. And although that sounds like a giant number, from a receive standpoint, it really isn't as big as you think, okay? Everything has loss. That's just something we deal with with radio transmissions. And the minute it leaves the antenna, it's, you know, degrading. So, again, keep all that in mind. And as a very old ham told me, there is no such thing as a bad antenna, except for the one that isn't in the air. So, look at your situation, look at what you want to do, and just go for it and build yourself an antenna. Um, Anyway, hey, with all that, I'm Stu, AG6AG. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, it was a bit of effort to put together with all the graphics, but I think, at least I'm hoping, I got all the theory through in a way that you could understand it. And if I didn't, do me a favor. Let me know, okay? Uh, and, uh, hey, until the next time, again, this is Stu, AG6AG. Hope to hear you on the air.